Good afternoon, my name is Melinda Herring and I am the Deputy Director of the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council. We're so pleased to have you with us here today and we're going to talk about Ukraine's local elections which were held on Sunday with four phenomenal experts. We're so pleased to be uh, co-sponsoring this event with Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty, our great friends in Prague who run the phenomenal Radio Svoboda and also Schemes, which is a, a brilliant investigative program that Natalia uh, Sedelska runs, and she's one of our guests here today. We're also joined by Mihailo Shetel, who's the Odessa correspondent for Radio Svoboda. And from our team here in Washington, we have the brilliant Adrian Karnitsky of New York, and he's going to analyze the results. And then uh, Brian Mefford from Kiev, Ukraine, will be joining us shortly. Hi, Brian. Uh, glad to see you on the on the call. So I'd like yep. to. Hi, Brian. I'd like. Uh, it, it's hard to say. It's hard to summarize these elections. Uh, in some ways, not much happened, and in some ways, a lot happened. I'm, I'm going to ask Brian. Uh, give us the overview, Brian. Uh, what happened on Sunday, and and what were you surprised by, if anything? I think the the biggest uh, the, the biggest summary for this election, uh, just as last year was a. Uh, an election about change and bringing Zelensky and serving other people into into office. Uh, this was an election about the status quo. Uh, people like their their uh, local mayors for the most part. Uh, decentralization over the last few years has been a big part of that, giving uh, you know local councils and mayors more budgetary control, uh, more control over you know where the resources are allocated. And as a result, uh, incumbent mayors did quite well across the country. Uh, obviously. Uh, in cases where no one gets 50% plus one, uh, there's a second run, uh, a second tour, as they say, that runoff election will take place on November 15th. And it will involve, of course, a lot of the big cities. Uh, but uh, in general, uh, incumbent mayors did very well uh, on on this election and, are, and many are likely to win in the runoffs in three weeks. Natalia, are, are you surprised by Zelensky's results? Uh, my understanding as of yesterday, he didn't win any, Servant of the People, his political party, didn't win any major mayoral races. What does this You're mean? Right. You're right. This is not an exactly a surprise, but it's one of the key elections uh, result that will have, I think, a long term consequences for national politics. Um, it is a serious drop in the rating of the presidential party, servant of the people, compared to last year's parliamentary and presidential elections. This time Zelensky's brand itself did not work miracles as previously. Looks like no candidate, as you say, from Servant of the People Party will win the mayoral election in any major regional center. And uh, the Servant of the People has better results in the district and regional councils, but I'm not sure that it's going to compensate their failure in large cities, including Kiev. But it, it's also true that no other national party has received uniformly high figures across the country. Um, so in big cities, it is the local for forces that receive uh, the support of the population. Some uh, other interesting observations I would like to mention, for example, rel relatively unsuccessful indicators newly created parties have uh, in which a huge resources were invested, including media and uh, wide across the country advertising resources. For example, victory of Palchevsky party, uh, by the way, journalists on the eve of elections found his Russian uh, passport um, is currently not getting to go to a city council. Uh, but party voice, Golos, for example, has interesting results throughout the country. As we know, their goal in these elections was um, to prove that even after the lead, their leader left, uh, Svetoslav Vokarchuk, it is not uh, a one-time political project and that is it has um, a future prospect. And uh, this time they will get their MPs, their deputies to the local con con uh, councils in many regions. Um, and also another important factor that could affect the results uh, this time is the re relatively low turnout. It's uh, only near 37%. Um, this is 10% less than in the previous local elections in 2015. Uh, was the reason um, local elections were always of less interest, but now I think people have not yet uh, realized uh, how important these elections are, especially um, in the context of decentralization and the new powers that local councils will receive. Uh, but also the second factor I think is the failing uh, is the the, the failing the falling confidence uh, in the government as such, and of course the third factor is a spread of coronavirus.
Yeah, that, that I was going to ask you if coronavirus uh, also diminished the, the rankings. Mihailo, you're down in Odessa. Uh, any surprises down there or any general thoughts on, on, on sort of the headlines? Biggest, yeah, the biggest pity for me is a very low turnout. I don't think it's relatively low. It's very low. It's about one third of uh, our country population. I'm afraid it's uh, uh, people just don't see their, their representatives in the list of parties which uh, were on the ballot. But uh, personally, I don't think that a servant of the people did very bad thing. Uh, the thing is that they managed to keep their central position. They were afraid of any radical uh, things they were trying to find their uh, their place in the political in the political landscape. They really didn't win any major cities. They really didn't uh, won't have I suppose any mayors over the Ukraine uh, over Ukraine. Sorry, but uh, they managed to to have some some groups of people uh, in some city councils. For example, in Odessa, they tried to find uh, politicians which didn't have very bad background, which didn't, uh, which weren't uh, seen as corruptioners. So they tried to find some good guys who's gonna solve the problems uh, of Odessa. Uh, speaking about um, about results, um, uh, it's a big pity for me that we don't discuss any official information. Uh, we don't have any information from Central Voting Committee, which is kind. Of which is kind of strange for me because uh, during last or even uh, the, the the last elections, okay, uh, they managed they did very good system of monitoring of voting. Uh, we could see uh, the accounting uh, on air over the internet. Now we don't have any official information. We have only exit polls, and I uh, I'm not sure that these exit polls are hundred percent right. Uh, we can't uh, be sure that central voting committee won't. Um, have any special decision to to change something uh, i really want to see official information about the voting process thanks great thanks a lot for joining us adrian uh bring, bring us home so brian has said that the regional strongmen did very well uh Zelensky's party did not do well uh, what what does this all mean well i would first want to say a few other things i think Please. that the, the, we we're seeing the the disappearance of uh, yulia timoshenko and her party as a, as a national political factor uh, and joining the ranks of minor parties. And there are all the dogs that didn't bark. Uh, Mr. Smeshko's uh, uh, party uh, did, not, uh, did not show. Uh, Mr. Polchevsky's party failed. The Kolomoisky party for the future uh, did not emerge as a, as a force. And we're down to really three parties that have some presence nationally in the oblast and in the city councils. And those are European solidarity, which came in first in about five regions. And I think um, the servant came in, in about in first in about four, but you know, with very small uh, uh, pluralities. And also uh, the opposition bloc captured uh, a number of its uh, uh, regional strongholds. So really what we're seeing is again, the, the, uh, the, the, the I wouldn't call it the polarization, but the geographic configuration that was traditional and which Zelensky was able to surmount with his campaign of unity, now reverting back to that traditional uh, uh, counterpoint between the more Russia-friendly, if not pro-Russian uh, option and the uh, you know, more hardline nationalist conservative option represented by Poroshenko. And in the middle, unfortunately, is not a party of values. It's really a party with, which is basically none of the above. It's a party that who cares that, you know, that there are no differences, that it doesn't matter what kind of deep cultural values you have, whether you honor the Soviet past, whether you, uh, you know, and I think that that's the big problem going forward, even for Zelensky's party at this lower level of acceptance, is that there is just no basis if he can't be the unifying candidate, there is no basis in a non-position. I think he was elected uh, basically on hope and aspiration, and he has failed to come up with a coherent set of uh, values, not to speak of fairly poor government performance, and all this is coming home to root. So I think he will have a hard time unless he changes ground and develops a coherent message uh, to, to 
claw his party back into uh, political preference. On the other hand, and this is one last thing, at the presidential level, he has the, A, the advantage of incumbency, and B, there are serious negatives on the side of both of the other two competing parties. The, the, the party of the East is even less acceptable to the center, to the centrist voter, because of the Medvedchuk connection and the perception that this is a fifth column, or at least linked to a fifth column uh, in operating inside Ukraine. And the other party has the deep negatives that President Poroshenko carried over from that election and which continue uh, to this day in which he has not been able to shake and which seem to top off at about 25 or 30 uh, percent of the vote. And again, so the idea that we have three competitors at the uh, at the party level, uh, Zelensky's being the weakest in that competition. But on the other hand, if we have we have three candidates potentially for president, and Zelensky has the greatest advantage, I think he is still capable of defeating any of the other uh, competitors from those two uh, polarities. Thanks a lot, Adrian. Brian, you are a great political consultant. So let me ask you the political question. How do you expect Zelensky to respond to the results? And there are, are major rumors of personnel changes at Bankova. We're starting to see some of those already. Do you, how do you think he'll pivot? Second, yeah, sorry. Um, you're exactly right. I mean, personnel changes are coming. Uh, the president attempted to you know, maintain his relevance through this referendum, uh, this non-binding referendum that was um, you know, they asked five questions to the voters across the country. Um, you know, I, he, he definitely, he definitely wants to maintain his relevancy and not, uh, you know, there's, there's been a trend throughout Ukraine's history with every president, you know, the presidents come in, they have big popularity a year later, two years later, you know, they're down in single digits. So we've seen I think we've lost Brian. Adrian, do you want to jump in on that question? When might be. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Ahead, yeah. So some of these governors, the Zelensky governors that ran and, and uh, didn't perform well, I mean, those would be top candidates to uh, to get sacked. Um, so yeah, I, do, I do think we'll see a lot of personnel changes. Um, you know, meanwhile, they do have, you know, factions on most of the major city councils. So they'll have some say in, in local government and these sorts of things. So as, as Adrian noted, they'll be relevant, uh, but they're certainly not dominant. Um, and I think this is gonna be a, a trend of, it's gonna be harder and harder for Zelensky to maintain his relevance. Okay, great. Just if I can make one more point, and that is I don't, I think it's personnel, but it's a specific type of personnel. I think the president has to finally open up to people of some capacity and expertise. Uh, to advise him and uh, to be more trusting of people who have, you know, a track record, not necessarily being politically engaged. I think he had that kind of a team initially and he panicked and jettisoned them. And in terms of internal palace politics, many of those people for reasons of alleged loyalty to the previous head of the administration were purged, but the people who've replaced them are pretty vacant, a pretty vacant lot, so to speak. And I think that the president would be well served to uh, populate the administration with some uh, clever, smart, policy-oriented people that can help educate them and help think through uh, how to move the country uh, forward. Because I do think we, many people believe that the reform momentum has stalled and that he is kind of rudderless at this point. Adrian, let me ask you a follow-up question uh, based on your previous remarks. Uh, you were describing basically three big uh, forces. Uh, is there an is there an opportunity now for another major political party to emerge? Do you see a, a space well, for? I actually think there is because I mean uh, yes, I think Ukraine has had historically the tradition that a an important surprise emerges in virtually every parliamentary uh, election. Of course, we are far uh, from that. Uh, uh, that phenomenon. And I doubt, given this showing, that Zelensky will be tempted into new new elections. But the fact that the sort of oligarchic projects and these doubtful fifth column projects didn't eat up a lot of oxygen, I, and, and that the traditional parties have these kinds of limits, suggests to me that there could be some 
place for another uh, political project or a couple of competing political projects. And then we could have the kind of phenomenon where we had Narodny Front, remember that emerged sort of out of nowhere. It wasn't uh, in terms of how well they, they had done. And similarly, we had had the Samopomuch phenomenon in the, in the elections previous to the, uh, to the last one. So I do think uh, there is this uh, potential and the fact that these other parties are so weak. The other interesting thing is whether mayors will capitalize on their, and I don't even know, it's, it's hard to see whether their mandate has legs. That is, can they influence the political options of their electors beyond their support for themselves and for their local little government uh, parties, their local local government base, can they create links with other political movements and then deliver those electoral votes to national political parties? I do think they'll be a bigger factor, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure, however, whether that phenomenon is is possible. But that's another thing to look out for. Absolutely. If you're just joining us, we are discussing Ukraine's local elections, which were on Sunday, and we're joined by two phenomenal, three phenomenal experts uh, who are based in, in Ukraine and one in New York. Now, Natalia, I want to ask you a question about Kolomoisky. Uh, obviously, Kolomoisky spent a ton of money and he didn't get very good results. Uh, why do you think that is? Uh, Melinda, if I may uh, go back a little bit, um, because I, I, as an investigative journalist, and we pay a lot of attention uh, to this, uh, and we made a lot of investigations last year, I would uh, actually uh, want to discuss why, uh, what may be the reasons that uh, servant of the people um, performed uh, the way they performed on these local elections. Um, for, for example, uh, of course, there's a number of factors, and uh, radio swoboda observers, as well as international public state similar uh, problems that Zelensky has not been able to solve for a year and a half uh, in power, having actually his majority in the parliament and controlling the government. Um, remember another moment in the presidential and then in the parliamentary elections, Zelensky tried to avoid uh, sharp ideological discussions. He almost did not have any public briefings where we as a journalist can come and ask him questions. And this lack of strong uh, position uh, then played a plus for him, a positive for him. And uh, everybody was building uh, his own expectations uh, in his mind. But now it has uh, the opposite effect because the voter can already judge by president's actions and the lack of strong and consistent positions in ideological and geopolitical questions pushes uh, voters away from him both in the East and uh, in the West of the country. But as investigative journalists, we also recorded a number of events and facts that went against President Zelensky promises, which he did voice. For example, Zelensky promised that the relations between the government uh, officials and the oligarchs will be transparent. Why then did the scheme's reporters repeatedly record how the president's allies come to the oligarchs' offices uh, under cover of night? Why are their talks uh, are secret and hidden still? Another example that did not go uh, unnoticed by many Ukrainians, more than a year ago, Zelensky announced an official investigation into the political power of Viktor Medvedchuk, who is close to Vladimir Putin. Um, Zelensky hinted that the party is financed uh, by cash from abroad, he said, and it will be a high profile story. That was his words, but nothing happened. And uh, Medvedchuk took an active part in these local elections. And isn't it interesting that we, Skims uh, reporters, saw uh, the head of the security service of Ukraine, uh, who I think was going to uh, conduct this official investigation against Medvedchuk, we saw him on the birthday of Medvedchuk's ally, Grigory Surkis. Or another example, isn't it interesting how the member of the parliament, the servant of the people, Andriy Kolodov, visited a wedding of Medvedchuk's son? And uh, just one more, another important example, which I think um, is that Zelensky, uh, remember, he promised uh, to abolish the immunity of the parliamentarians. And on practice, this decision was handed over to one single person, uh, the prosecutor general, who is appointed by the president Zelensky. And our schemes program uh, already revealed two cases when the prosecutor general, Irina Venediktova, blocked an effective investigation against members of Zelensky's party. 
And finally, Zelensky did not keep his word even in some very symbolic things. Simple th symbolic things, I would say. Remember how uh, his voters really liked his promises to give up the attributes, the privileges of power, such as motorcades, using state dachas. But as Skim's report, uh, reports showed, Zelensky now rides in motorcades and also he moved to a state dacha, which he promised to give away to children. That was his public quote. Thanks, Natalia. I think those are, those are important factors. Does anyone want to take the Kolomoisky question? Yeah, uh, can I? Please, please, Mihaly. Uh, can I try? Uh, just like Natalia said, uh, she uh, she touched a very important topic about what Zelensky didn't say, didn't do what he promised to do. But I would like to add just a little bit about absence of some systematic uh, political work. For example, in Odessa region, uh, it was just two or three months ago when. Uh, his party showed uh, people who is going to to be to become politicians who is going to uh, to go to city council no one knew uh, who is zelensky is going to to represent his as his people and the same situation was at the eastern ukraine there was no teams no teamwork uh, which people could, could see and could understand that they do they like uh, his people or do they don't uh, or or they don't uh, uh, coming to colonized questions, his political party is uh, due to exit polls, we'll have three, two or three mayors of, uh, of this political party too, yeah, Lutsk and Cherkasy. They, due to exit polls, they're going to win. Uh, I would like to underline that next uh, next parliamentary elections, they will be only proportional. We won't have candidates who will go to parliament fr from the region. So the political, uh, these local elections are very important because it's kind of ground for, for next parliamentary elections. So in the regions where Kolomoisky managed to get his people to the city council or even got uh, to get his people to the, as mayors, he, it's his possible future ground regions which he can use. He lost Dnipro, surely, to, to Filatov and Corbyn and their, their political party, uh, Propositsa, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so he, he's going to move to, to Lutsk and to Cherkas, possibly, surely. Uh, in Lutsk, there is Igor Palica, who is his uh, close, maybe friend, maybe business partner. When we talk about Kolomoisky, we can't be sure. Uh, but uh, he's his loyal, uh, he's his loyal, uh, a man, so he may be may possibly go to Lusk as his next ground region. That's that's maybe uh, the only thing I can say because we don't have any official results till now. What's going to be with political parties on Ibutnia? Maybe Kalamoisky will try to press on the central voting committee to to raise his uh, to to give his party more voices that they really did have. So we still don't know. Okay, thank you. Of course, there's another Kolomoisky factor, and that is the factor inside the Servant of the People Party. Uh, today, the president was heard uh, 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 praising uh, 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 Deputy uh, Dubinsky, who is uh, a leading voice of Kolomoisky's interests inside the parliament, for the excellent job he did in Kievska Oblast in protecting the servants' vote. But we really have to take a closer look at whether of, at who these servants are and who it is that they are serving, because there is a fairly large. So he's got an outside game and an inside game. The the main point of the game is to insert as many people believe Mr. Politza as the prime minister and to use the weakening of the consolidated servant party and the influence of other groups as the unity of that party uh, uh, dissolves uh, to uh, press forward someone in a new kind of coalition, uh, knowing that there are unlikely to be uh, new, new elections given how weak uh, servants uh, seems to be on the, at the national level. Great, thank you. Brian, uh, two people want to know the following, Anders Oslin and then, uh, let's see, Boris uh, Bondar asks, will Zelensky turn to the pro-Western parties or stay with the pro-Russian opposition platform? That's a good question. Um, obviously, uh, you know, we uh, that remains to be seen. Uh, one, uh, in one race in Tcharkasi, actually, uh, that, we'll get to see what Zelensky is going to do in that case because the candidate uh, for uh, in, in the runoff is from Holos. So there's a Holos candidate in Cherkasy and there's already talk about serving the people actually backing 
the holos candidate against the incumbent, Mr. Bondarenko, with uh, Zamai Butni. So that's kind of an interesting dynamic. I mean, that's that's not indicative of what's going uh, to, to be nationwide. Uh, but um, I, I think, for the most part, though, I think uh, you know you gotta you gotta say that recognizing the problem is the first the first step. And I don't I don't see any indication that the president and his team uh, think there's a problem yet. They they haven't figured out there's a problem. Um, I would just add to you know in this election, uh, yes, the turnout was lower, uh, but you know these old these old tactics of buying votes and spending a lot of money, people see through that. Um, you know, Zamai um they they have a, they have a few victories, but uh, if you base it on what they actually spent per vote, that's a lot of money chasing a, a few votes. Um, and of course, obviously, Mr. Polchevsky, uh, he had billboards, you know, all across the country, uh, starting way back from summer, and he spent a ton of money. Um, and I guess, uh, some people are going to be asking for their money back, and that's what I, I would suspect. We would love to have you uh, join us with questions. You can type them in the Q&A, or you can send them to us on Twitter. Uh, Laura Haig has a question. Do we have any reports on the number of women who were elected? Brian, do you have a number on that, or Natalia? I, I don't have a, a concrete number. But no, you said no no, no mayors, right, are, are, are women. Is that right? I think there's no big city mayors that uh, come to mind right now. I just wanted to add that these elections actually were organized with new rules and uh, one of them was gender quotas uh, that were in force for the first time. And parties have been required to have at least two women out of every five uh, candidates on the list. Uh, by the way, before the election, the Radio Svoboda launched a special project, Women's Matter, in which journalists talked uh, about women who join uh, the work of local government and build political careers in their own communities, as I know Mikhailo talked with a few of them too. Yeah, I, I, made a, I made a good interview with one of such, uh, such women uh, uh, who is a member of uh, City Council. She was elected in 2015 as a member of uh, Poroshenko party. And just a few months before that election, she changed her party to op opposition bloc. Uh, it, it's just another evidence of how uh, active, and she is, and she was, and um, I think she will be a very active council, councilwoman. Uh, they are switching sides to, to gain, to, to save their position in the local authorities, switching sides to pro-Russian parties and pro-Russian organizations like opposition bloc in the Odessa region. Adrian, go ahead. Yeah, so perhaps this new uh, entry of women in, into the level of town councils and local councils will yield future political fruits, so to speak, and more women candidates. But if you look at the major cities, I mean, if you look at the top five candidates, um, only in Kiev with 5% was there a woman represented in these lists. It's a really miserable idea. And the fact that political parties don't even understand even cynically the expediency of being a little bit different and bringing more votes uh, by engaging women and building, building an electorate uh, is actually a pretty sad commentary on their lack of imagination. But let me ask a follow-up. Are any of the parties okay? Is Holos or European Solidarity, uh, do they place a higher premium on having females on their list? Or is it pretty much the same across the board? Well, it's now mandated. So uh, I guess they, they placed the kind of priority that the law uh, law required them uh, to to place. I mean, Holos is led by a woman now, so yeah, exactly. Uh, so that, that little, would seem to but but Kivshida is fading. So maybe uh, you know uh, other women leaders will emerge to occupy the space that Yulia Tymoshenko uh, deceptively held because she was an example, but it was she was the only example. Yeah, and now maybe one hopes that this process over time will yield. Uh, you know, more of a Europeanization of Ukraine. For sure, for sure. Anders Oslin has two more big questions. I think that the best person to answer these uh, are probably uh, Natalia and Mihello and maybe Adrian. Um, has Zelensky lost his parliamentary majority and will the government change? And if so, how? Hmm. Well, um, Zelensky, I think, now is in a rather difficult position. Uh, he really support, surrounded himself with close people who cared about his own comfort. And meanwhile, the destructive.
processes were uh, taking place in the political force of the servant of the people in the parliament, which were, by the way, laid down during previous elections when this party was formed in a hurry, when uh, it accepted representatives of various financial and industrial groups with their different businesses and uh, political interests. Um, it is difficult how uh, Zelensky will uh, achieve this task, but I think that he uh, now faces a very serious goal to contain his party and to maintain control over it. Uh, it is possible that this will be opposed by oligarchs and strong political players who will invite parliamentarians to play uh, instead in their in interest. And often uh, after such uh, results in local uh, elections, it is quite possible that some of party members who are thinking about their political future, for example, for the next elections, will be more liable to such proposals. Can I, can I make one point? And that is that, that not all the configurations and movements inside the servant are in the direction of oligarchy and in the direction of special interests. There is a small group of people that kind of replicates the role that the Euro optimists played in the previous parliament, uh, more European oriented, uh, reform oriented people. And there may be 30 or 40 of them who have relatively strong, both patriotic and reform credentials and who uh, kind of represents some of the values that the first wave of government appointments as, as Zelensky had made. And they also are part of the fragmentation, but in a sense, they are a, a positive trend in terms of the fragmentation. Wonderful. I'd like to zoom in a little bit and talk about what happened in Kiev, what happened in Lviv, and then what happened in Odessa. I'm going to, for the question about Kiev, Natalia, why don't you take this since sure. you're uh, in Kiev and you're watching this closely. Sure. So my question is this. Uh, Vitaly Klitschko is widely viewed by Ukrainians as pretty incompetent. He hasn't improved the infrastructure of the city. The bridges are a disaster. Uh, he, and he's also been accused of abuse of office in construction schemes. Uh, how did he do and why does he remain so popular? Hmm. Yes, for the second time, Kievans expressed serious support for Vitaly Klitschko. He has become a vivid uh, illustration of a general trend that has spread across the country that residents of large cities trust local authorities more than central ones. In our journalistic investigations, I mean the schemes program, we also paid attention to the capital's problems, how untransparently large sums for the city contracts for their infrastructure construction are being allocated or how neglected the historical architecture heritage is, for example. But so far, most Kievans do not see an, a better alternative for Klitschko, and that's the fact. Also, Klitschko's success uh, was preceded by a number of interesting events and decisions. First, Klitschko, who was initially under attack by Zelensky as a representative of the old government uh, a year ago, uh, later found common uh, ground, let's say, with the presidential administration. And in general, the election went smoothly and without kind of obstacles for him. Uh, it is also interesting that Klitschko refused to participate in the so-called uh, party of mayors, uh, but instead he decided to develop his own party, Udar, which successfully made it to the Kyiv uh, city council, and uh, on the basis of which I think uh, Klitschko is planning to uh, develop a further political career. Uh, but another interesting point in Kyiv, as throughout Ukraine's mayors will have to unite with other political forces uh, to form a majority. It's uh, an informal, right? An informal majorities uh, in the councils. Because for example, Klitschko's Udar received uh, about, uh, I believe only 20% 20, 20 of the vote. So the key intrigue uh, is with whom Klitschko will be negotiating uh, to unite. Will Poroshenko or maybe Servant of the People or Voice Party join this union? And finally, how influential the uh, pro-Russian forces will be in the capital? Because as we know, one of the kind of surprises of the election is Alexander Popov, the opposition bloc representative who took the second place in mayor's elections in Kyiv in a city uh, that hosted two revolutions for the last 15 year, uh, years in a struggle for a democratic and European future. Thanks so much. Adrian, I'd like to move to Lviv. So the mayor uh, there, Andrei uh, Sadovi, was not going to run and then he decided to run. 
Uh, we know that some of Pomish got clobbered last year in the parliamentary elections, but that the mayor remains uh, a force in Western uh, Ukraine. What's this appeal based on? And do you think that some of Pomish is going to get a second wind or is it a spent force in national politics? I think it is a spent force in national politics, partly because it is semi-successful in Lviv, which is to say it has a very strong regional identity. It has a, a, sort, of, a sort of a base with a middle, middle class uh, voters. And it seems to me that, uh, you know, the strength of Sadeve is paradoxically the weakness of the national party. It's just too regional, too uh, local. And uh, uh, his inner circle and the, the inner circle of the future was too closely allied with his, with his local uh, uh, So the second, the second point, however, I would make is that there will be a runoff for mayor. And again, uh, Mr. Sinutka did, uh, from Poroshenko's party, did better than one might have, might have uh, uh, expected. And I, it's unclear uh, the, how, what the configuration will be, but I do see that since European solidarity emerged by far as the largest party with, I think, over 31% of the vote in the city council election to 20 for some of Pomich, that they will, that I think Poroshenko and company will make a determined push to try to, to, to claim that place. I, I think that Sadeve will still uh, prevail, but it could be a very, a very competitive race. And it is the comeback. I mean, European solidarity is now you know, by a very small margin, the largest party in Kiev, it's the largest, or even with Udar in Kiev, it's back in uh, Lviv, it's back in a number of centers. And it's also very interesting that the, I think Sadovi so had the advantage of incumbency and almost all of the mayors who were running for re-election have uh, won on the first round or captured very, very high levels of support. So I do think, uh, you know, he benefited from that. I, but I do not see him emerging as a national uh, political force. He had his chance. That chance has passed him by. Yep. Uh, now I'm going to turn to Odessa. Uh, Brian and Mihailo, you both uh, have watched Truhanov with a lot of fascination over the years. Uh, I really don't get it. Can you help me understand why he's appealing? Uh, he's not a good guy, to put it very diplomatically. Why do voters keep putting him in office? Mihailo, you want to go first? Uh, yes, uh, I will start if Ryan doesn't mind. Sure. Uh, the first factor is very important. Trukhanov has money from decentralization, which he can uh, do whatever he wants with. He can do parks or build uh, houses, anything he wants. And uh, people in Odessa think that it's Trukhanov who they should say thank you for it. I was, um, I once heard as one old woman said, I don't like how things are going in Odessa, but I do like Trukhanov. She just didn't understand the connection between these two. Uh, the first thing. Uh, the second thing, uh, Trukhanov didn't have strong opponent like uh, in 2015 or now. Zelensky chose a very strange politician to, to represent his party, Alek Filimonov, who doesn't have any political experience, any civic experience, nothing in his background thinks, uh, uh, speaks about his perspectives as a politician. I uh, heard his press conferences, I read his interviews, and he didn't show any political perspective uh, in what he said. Uh, and the third factor, which is very important now, uh, Trukhanov is going to have a second tour with a much more pro-Russian politician than he is. It's a representative of opposition bloc. And I'm sure that lots of, no, not lots of people, uh, somebody will vote for Trukhanov, just, just uh, not to spoil it to become mayor. And the last one, but not the least, uh, my Odessa colleagues counted that just 75,000 uh, people in Odessa voted for Trukhanov on the 25th of, of October. It's a very low numbers, very low numbers. And uh, if there was some strong opponent, opponent, he could use the rest of that voices, but no one appeared, unfortunately. Thanks a lot. Brian? Yeah, I would just add, you know, uh, Trukhanov and all these, all these mayors, uh, with the decentralization of money, they're able to deliver services uh, whether that's transportation, parks, you know, you name it. Uh, and Trukhanov is, is actually relatively efficient at delivering, you know, local local services. Um, I, I was surprised he did not perform better in round one, and he does face a real challenge from Mikola Skorik and the opposition platform. Um, previously, Trukhanov had basically dismantled their the opposition platform uh, faction within the city council, and but now they've, they've been 
uh, put back there by the voters. Uh, so it's going to be an interesting round two. And ironically, uh, the national, you know, patriotic forces, the the, uh, the pro-European forces are probably going to have to hold their nose and, and vote for Trukhanov over, over Skorik. Gotcha. Okay, now this is the fun part you've all been waiting for. This is the blitz round. We have 13 minutes and we have lots of wonderful questions. So I'm going to pose these questions and you have two sentences. Uh, so here we go. This question is for uh, Mr. Mefford. This is from Mattia Nellis, our, our great friend in Germany. Uh, would, um, what future do you see for decentralization reform? Sluha, broadly speaking, lost against local elites. Will Zelensky, Sluha, be tempted to roll back on decentralization, which guarantees financial flows for local elites? Yeah, I don't see there's any way that they can, uh, uh, you know, Pandora's box has been opened with decentralization and uh, the mayors and the councils and the voters uh, simply don't want to go back to having, you know, keep control of everything. So uh, decentralization has been one of the, I guess, the most positive developments in, in Ukraine over the last five, six years. Um, so I don't see any way that it, it would be extremely unpopular uh, to try to roll back. Great. Thank you. Adrian, this one's for you from uh, from Robert Hollands. Is there any truth to the accusations that Hungary interfered in the elections in the Zarkopatia region? Um. I'm sure they did, but the you know the 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 Hungarian uh, government continues to play with the local independent Hungarian party, but they got five percent of the vote in a in a region. They they don't have any place where there is a you know there is no separatist uh, threat. There is a threat of making themselves a nuisance, and the Hungarian government is simply interested in playing to the crowd in Hungary that they are defending uh, their uh, countrymen in other places, that they are empowering them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But they do not constitute any any real and serious threat. They are uh, uh, purely uh, window dressing for uh, Mr. Orban's political uh, theater. Thank you. Brian, this is a question uh, for you from Ambassador, former Ambassador Roman Westchuk. He wants to know how important was actual local governance slash municipal services performance versus partisan affiliation? I see results aligning quite a bit with IRI surveys of big city satisfaction. Yeah, there's definitely a correlation and uh you know again a lot of incumbents uh you know uh, are going to be returned to office uh some have already won uh because it all it all comes down to you know providing those those services for uh, the local voters so uh and then you know iri's big municipal survey uh which they do every year uh is a uh, you can track pretty much the satisfaction with delivery of services and and who got re-elected the ambassador is exactly right Okay, great. A uh, question from Ambassador uh, Sandy Virchbaugh, and I think this question is probably best for either Mihailo or Natalia. Are there any implications from these elections for the Donbass? Many IDPs voted in their current place of residence. Does it make it less likely that they will ever return to the Donbass? I think Mikhail, Mikhailo can answer this. Mikhailo um, is a Donbass correspondent of Radio Svoboda. Uh, yes, it's like my second topic, maybe even first topic, so I will answer. Uh, the first thing, it was a very good initiative to let IDPs vote in the cities they do live in for the last five, six years. It's a very good thing for them to take part in uh, municipal politics, to, to have some impact on what is going on in their, uh, in their cities of residence. I don't think that the, it can be evidence of uh, are they going or not going to return to, to, to their uh, to their nation cities? Uh, everybody is hoping that we will return. To, Ukraine will take control over Donbas and over Crimea, and these people uh, will have possibility to to return to their national city, nation cities. But uh, I don't see any connections uh, between that. It's just there. It's an additional possibility for them to have impact on local politics. Great, thank you. I, uh, this is a great question. I think this is for Brian Mefford. Tell us about Kharkiv. Rumors continue to abound about the how uh, the health status of re-elected Mayor Kearns, who's I think in Germany. He has been seen by successive national governments as a stabilizing element in the east. Is Kiev paying sufficient attention to the situation in Kharkiv? Brian. Yeah, Kern is, is uh, you know, he's like uh, the Jason in those Friday the 13th movies. I mean, he's got, he got shot. He uh, he had a double, you know, pneumonia. He had some coronavirus. I mean, and somehow he keeps, you know, keeps on going on. Uh, and is and again, he's actually very good at delivering services for the, the local residents in Kharkiv. And, and uh, so he won quite decisively uh, over um, Alexander Feldman, who's a, 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 one of the wealthy 
businessman in the city. So a uh, very decisive, uh, you know, political leader for the East. Wonderful. Adrian, this is a great question for you from uh, Bogdan Sto uh, Stopa. He wants to know, mayors of some major cities have already refused to implement COVID restrictions imposed by the central government. Could these elections lead to de facto federalization with local elites having veto powers over central government decisions? Um, I don't think we're anywhere near the kind of crisis that existed in the last days of Yanukovych and the Orange or the Orange Revolution when local governments were consolidating and organizing and mobilizing. But I do think that it points to a problem, and that is that Zelensky did very badly on the basis of relatively good figures and coping with COVID. And now there is this rapidly rising wave, which may require a larger shutdown, uh, which will create further tension and, in my view, will erode his personal popularity because he and the government will have to take decisive action or watch uh, the spread of the virus. I think today they announced that if more than 15,000 infections are noted per day, which would be double the current rate, that they would implement serious quarantining restrictions. And I think that, uh, you know, I think they will be forced to do that. That will create tension, but I think that the implication is not for the collapse of chain lines of authority and chain of authority, but it is a real threat to the further erosion of his uh, political support, which is, you know, has substantially dropped, but he is still by, by a measure, uh, the most popular uh, and the most trusted politician in the country. Thank you. Okay, a question from my colleague Andrew Denary at the Atlantic Council. Natalia, this one is for you. What do you make of Zelensky's five questions referendum on a wide range of policy issues? Why did he do this? And can we take anything from the results of these ballot questions? Hmm. That's a very good question, uh, and uh, it uh, also sounds from uh, international observers about so-called additional poll, five questions from the president organized near the stations uh, at the voting day. And experts uh, emphasized uh, that uh, this was a sign of uh, use of administrative resource by Zelensky to raise the rating of his own uh, party. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, I think this is a question for Adrian from Robert Bag. He says, do these local voting results encourage pro-Russian forces in cities like Kharkiv, Dnipro, Odessa to, ask more, uh, to act more openly? Can Moscow feel encouraged to start again its destabilizing efforts in the east and south of east of Ukraine? Uh, I don't think so, but I think that there's another issue and a problem that I think bears discussion, and that is the internal problems inside the opposition bloc. First of all, the unity that existed heretofore uh, under the Yanukovych era uh, is gone because Mr. Akhmetov has uh, abandoned that project and is operating politically in a very different way. And I think that uh, that is a very substantial loss for those uh, political forces and that political orientation. Secondly, the injection of Mr. Medvedchuk and his party uh, and his movement, which is perceived by many neutral and even uh, Russia, uh, uh, more Russia, maybe not antagonistic to Russia forces. Nevertheless, he is perceived as being uh, right hand of Putin, of Putin, who today is understood by Ukrainians to be waging uh, a war and uh, responsible for the conflict. So I think they have a serious internal problem, which they will have to resolve if they want to become a kind of a larger political force, they will have to cope with the Medvedchuk problem. And, and there is tension, it is acknowledged, uh, between uh, the Lovochkin Boyko group, which I think senses political opportunity. And I think they now understand that there is a disadvantage uh, uh, presented uh, by uh, the, you know, Medvedchuk is kind of a, a drag on their, uh, their electoral potential. If they resolve that question, I think they will become a larger uh, they will return to being a, a more serious political force. If they return as, as a serious political force, minus Mr. Medvedchuk, I think they will be less of a Russian fifth column than the, the political configuration currently is. Okay, great. Thank you, Adrian. Okay, my last question to Brian, Natalia, and uh, Mihailo. What is the one race you're watching in the second round? Brian, let's start with you. 
Just one. Uh, I, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I would say I would say Odessa now, just because it's going to be very interesting if Trikonov can hold on um, and uh, basically unite with uh, kind of pro-European forces uh, to get them to hold their nose and vote for him. Great, thanks, Natalia. Could you repeat the question, please? I sure. didn't get it. Sure. So there's going to be a second round uh, elections in in the races where uh, the folks didn't get enough uh, in the first mm -hmm. round. Of the second round races for the mayor seat, which, which one is the most interesting that you're watching? It says something bigger about Ukraine. Um, I think for me, actually, Lviv is very interesting because Senyutka and Sadova is going really close. They have really small differences in votes, and it's really it's going to be a field for very um, interesting uh, um, um, unites of uh, different parties. For example, it really matters how the Golos, let's say, uh, will act. Uh, will they call to uh, vote for Senutko? Will they call to uh, vote for Sadovi? Like, it's it's going to be very interesting to see how the party will develop their their actions. Which way do you think Holos will go? I don't know. <laughs> That's <laughs> intrigue. <laughs> okay. Mihailo? Yeah, I would say Odessa, but Brian already mentioned that. Uh, <laughs> so I, I would choose Slovyansk in Donbass region. There is a uh, it's a city with uh, interesting uh, interesting candidates. One is a ruling uh, mayor who is uh, pro-Russian, surely. The second is uh, pro-Russian also from opposition uh, platform uh, who is trying to to take the position. And I would love to see the evolution of the ruling mayor who needs to. Uh, to take attention of pro-European, pro-Western people in Slavyansk and in Donbass region and the Rasa. Uh, what's he's going to do? How he's going to to show that he's progressing, that he's pro-Western uh, without losing support of his um, core electoral voters who are pro-Russian or at least anti-Poroshenko. Uh, anti so that's interesting for me. Mihailo, that's a really interesting race, and I hope that you'll write an article for the Atlantic Council for our Ukraine Alert blog. We'd love to have it. Uh, thank, you. thank you so much for joining us today. I really enjoyed this conversation with you, Adrian, Natalia, Brian, and Mihailo. Uh, it was wonderful to be with you. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you, Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty. It's always a joy to work with you. Until next time, thank you very much. Thank you.